So, um, how should I put this? Doing pretty much what Yari already talked about, and, and I guess you'll be kind of priming for the whole course about this, but I'm gonna give you kind of a different angle into this. So it's kind of really bombarding you today with these style things and skills and all of this from different angles so that you can kind of find, well, they say that you have to hear it three times before you really learn it. So we're, we're doing that, that. So I'm getting actually back to what was kind of the purpose of the exercise last week, to prime you to think about your own role, your angle and your techniques. And I call, from lack of a better word, I call them your style. Just kind of like, I like to think, I'm not a musician myself, but I, I, you know, a musician, you can play the same song, but people have a little bit different styles how they play with it. And, and you can, you know, have very slight variations in style, or you can do it very, very differently. The kind of thinking you as a musician, as an artist, as a facilitator, and letting, kind of bringing your style into it, because it's a good thing and uh, your personality and everything. And <clears throat> before I go to the kind of the narrative storytelling approach into this, it's kind of kind of remind you that if you imagine yourself in a situation, just like the exercise last week, that you're kind of just thrown into situation. Uh, in the real world, you're not necessarily that explicitly thrown, but you find yourself in different situations. And ideally, you kind of choose how are you going to act as a facilitator. So in other words, you kind of think that, okay, what is my style in this situation? How I'm going to facilitate now, whether it's one workshop or one, you know, one hour meeting, or maybe it's a longer project. The first point is that the actual context, the stuff that we started with that you recognize, it pushes you most probably to take a certain role. So imagine the last time you were, for example, planning a workshop. Uh, you can imagine that everybody has these certain expectations that you're the workshop planner. It's like a theater play that it, this role means certain things, this, this and this, that you're going to do this and this is how you're going to act. So that the context, whether it's the organization culture, whether it's the colleagues around you, whether it's the setup in general, kind of pushes you to behave in a certain way. And there's no right or wrong, but it's just something you need to recognize. So for example, if somebody's, you know, <laughs> you're, you're hired as a head of a team, then the role that you're being pushed is that you are more of a leader and less of a neutral facilitator, if you will. Then of course, you might find yourself, if you are self-aware and you have the reflexivity and, and, and the reflection part, you might recognize that you often kind of take a certain role. But maybe you're really comfortable in a certain role. But this is the way you do. This is your style. And that's, of course, perfectly fine. You have your personality. And part of the personality, of course, is your experience. Are you uh, more younger? Let's say that you're 23 years old and, and you have a different experience than, let's say, somebody who's 53 years old. And that has to be taken into account. And in that risk, you take a certain role because of your age, your background, your experience, maybe your education, and all the kind of variety there. But maybe the question we're gonna now talk about, or actually I'm gonna go different styles, and then I'm gonna use the word breakout room. Uh, remember, you don't have to escape. Uh, it's not an escape. It's not an escape room, yeah. Uh, so what we're going to put you quickly then talk about in the breakout room is kind of that. How do you play these different styles? Can you play with them? Play maybe as an instrument, but play as in children play. Uh, how can you try different styles? How do you adapt maybe? So one style in this context. Again, going back what just Yari said about learning and education and all the meta skills. And, you know, can you, are you, are you, do you have a meta routine where you experiment? different styles in, in this context. Uh, and what I mean by style is, is kind of this everything, your mindset. But okay, in this project, I'm going to have a different mindset. I'm going to be the really angry, grumpy person because I've never been. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's very constructive, what you get. Habits, I just talked about. Your role, maybe think of a role as a theater play. What is my role in this play? Uh, the language that you use, 
that is huge also very concrete way of trying different styles are you going to be so very sarcastic <laughs> or maybe you're not going to be sarcastic just as an example tools look even your clothing what's what's the what are the clothes you put on to kind of you know to help people realize what kind of a style and role you're taking good so <clears throat> a little bit of background story for this so next i'm going to go over 13 10 plus 3 different archetypes for organizational change agents so this is actually the background story of this is uh for the, for the, I think three, two, three years ago, I was working together with the uh, management consultants at Bearing Point. And I always been a big fan in service design about, you know, using uh, storytelling and narratives. And in storytelling, you have these archetypes. And I think it is the famous uh, psychologist uh, Jung, who actually had this idea of different archetypes we have as uh, psychological human beings. So what if we take these narrative archetypes that are used in storytelling and you can identify movies and trying to find what kind of archetypes we can identify. And, you know, three years ago, I had the, uh, my management consultant colleagues who had done enormous amount of transformation projects in different organizations. We started playing around what kind of archetypes they could be. And now I'm going to go over them. Um, so keep in mind, do you recognize them? Uh, are you maybe some of them yourself? Uh, do you know somebody else who's exactly that? Maybe in some situation you have some that, so let's go. First one. So maybe you, your facilitation style is that you are the hero. When you get into a situation, you are the leader that people follow. And that is just fantastic. We've all been in a situation where just somebody takes lead and it's so, oh, so easy to sit back in that boat and just let that person lead. And, and of course, people have talent to this. Uh, the talent is inspiring others to believe, uh, showing by example, and, and just taking ownership and charge and being kind of a credible hero. And each of these uh, archetypes, you can also put, I put these kind of weaknesses and maybe greatest fears to maybe give some kind of, you know, if you think these as a story characters, then you need to <laughs> have the uh, superpower, the talent, but you also need to understand the weakness and the fears of these characters. And of course, the greatest fear of a hero, for example, is that they don't have any followers. Or even worse, there's not a battle to fight. How can you be a hero if there's not a battle to fight? So that was number one. Number two, I even dressed up for this one. Today I have my coach outfit. So coach, of course, is the uh, person who kind of helps others. This is really a facilitating role. That, that definitely you're not the one, especially in sports situation, you're not the one who's competing. The other one is competing. You're coaching. So it's kind of in a coach role. It is obvious that I'm not going to run the marathon. It's you. But I'm going to do my best to make you run the marathon really fast. Of course, if you're a coach, you're more probably talented that you're actually turning ordinary people into more motivated and inspirational And uh, for example, me, I now find myself often, at least I reflect and reflect that I often find myself as a coach. And I'm very familiar with some of the weaknesses here. That I, so for example, the, for the coach, it's really too important that you're not the star. It's the other person. And to be a successful coach always means that the other person has to succeed. Uh, good. And then we have this secretary style of facilitation. And uh, anybody who has worked long know that secretaries are, can actually have a lot of indirect power. And that's why kind of this illustration, uh, these illustrations are actually done by a friend of mine, Levi Lemmet. We did, we did this together. Uh, so he chose a ninja here, kind of this invisible facilitator. And of course, typically, of course, here in the picture as well, the, the power of the secretary facilitator is that they actually write down, they do the reification, if you will. Let everybody do the participation and shine and explode and do whatever they do. But at the end of the day, the secretary does the reification, and that is indirect power. And of course, a good secretary is very good at organizing, documentation, 
maybe avoiding internal politics, avoiding some bullets, and making others succeed, just like the coach. Uh, maybe the greatest fear here is that, that somebody actually pushes the secretary into a situation where they need to take a stand, take charge, and have other people look for guidance. Then the guru, facilitator. This is the person who kind of takes the role that I know everything, I'm extremely experienced, and, and probably they are. The source of infinite wisdom. And their talent, of course, is just that they know their stuff. Vast experience. And the kind of the ability to see through all the complexities, all the uncertainty. I have seen this many times in the past 50 years, and this is what you need. So definitely there is the guru facilitation aspect as well. And then this is my favorite when it comes to organization transitions um, or, or digital transformations. There's a lot of revolutionaries. And this is kind of the thing I had earlier in the previous lectures. But you know, viva la revolucion, we're gonna take down the men in suits and, and, and you know, nothing can change the movement. And then, you know, we're gonna have a new company culture and so forth and so forth. And of course, people like these are very talented in, in showing their emotions. Again, what Yari mentioned earlier, showing emotions builds trust and people start trusting these people as leaders or facilitators and uh, believing that, hey, yeah, there is a bigger change going on. And this person seems to know what's going on. I believe in him or her. And there's, of course, in the revolutionary, there is this kind of, you need this authority figure. You need, you need the scapegoat to revolt against. And we all know that the, the problem with the uh, really powerful revolutionary is that once the revolution is done, uh, what do they do then? <laughs> Start to looking for a new revolution. <clears throat> or to put it another way, just falling in love with the revolution itself and forgetting, remember, not the desired impact. Kind of related to the revolutionary is the outlaw. So this is the, uh, uh, sometimes here we have the kind of the Lara Croft Tomb Raider picture, but in another way, it could be that, you know, the person who has been in the company for 30 years, sitting there in the corner and just doesn't give a damn what the bosses say. And they've seen the transformations and, and, and the talent is that they have the ability to ignore policies and rules. They don't follow the laws. They don't give a shit about consequences. And of course, that is something to be admired. They are so kind of self-conscious in a good way. Uh, they don't care about the governance models, just like it says. You know, transformations come and go. But of course, the biggest uh, weakness for an outlaw is that they typically are the lone wolves. You know, if nobody follows them and nobody, you know, they become the, the hermit. I would say, of an organization. Then related to the secretary, we have the servant. <clears throat> Maybe the servant is not as, has a little bit different than the secretary. This is kind of, you know, I would say, a typical consultant, the obedient helping hand. I'm very humble and I do exactly what I'm asked for. I'm extremely professional, I'm very predictable. You just tell me and I will facilitate you there. I will do everything you want to do. And uh, the weakness is, of course, becoming too robotic. If people are asking them, you know, do they have their own opinions? Or are they just doing what is told of them? And so forth. Now, one of my favorites here is the bureaucrat. We typically think that the bureaucrat is a bad thing, which is, of course, uh, how should I say, very naive, just as the thought that bureaucracy is a bad thing. No, it's not a bad thing. Bureaucracy has its purpose. But in a way, you can think the bureaucrat in this situation, that this is the objective process master. This is the one who sees through people's emotions, people's policies. This is the kind of the scientist who looks for objective truth. This is how science works. This is how viruses work in a society. And their talent is that they're very, very kind of they, their perseverance to stick to methods and respect the process. This is how our innovation process goes. And this is how we should do it. 
And of course, all of us are very familiar with the, with the weaknesses of a bureaucrat is that, you know, if there is a situation where you need creativity, if there's a situation where you need to break the rules, you know, maybe the bureaucrat is not the style you want when you're facilitating. Then of course, the facilitator, the change agent can be the boss. It can be the ruler. It can be the CEO. And, and you know, then you may be called a change leader, if you will. And it's a different kind of a style. It's a different kind of a role because now you are the big boss. You're the sovereign. And, and you're definitely kind of, you want the best for the, all the citizens. You want, when you want everybody in your company or everybody in your department. Uh, you're very empathetic towards them. And you want everything to work out fine. Uh, but with the big bosses, the kings and the queens, of course, is that who do they listen to? Now, if you're a big boss and you have hundreds of people or thousands of people working under you, you can't really go face to face with everybody. And, and, and you maybe become too distant to the grassroots where the change might be happening or the people you care about. Magician. This is, of course, the, I guess we've all seen a person like this, let's say a facilitator like this, and maybe you are. And maybe sometimes this is the style or the role you want to take. This is the genius. When you're stuck in a room and then you, you, you've done hundreds of post-its and you, you really can't move forward, then the magician comes there and just like, well, well, it looks like if I look at what you have done here on the whiteboard, it looks like this is what you're thinking and this is what you should do next and this is actually what you should do now. Am I right? And everybody's like, wow, <laughs> that's precisely what, what we just didn't see. And of course, a magician is very talented. Uh, the person is the wizard. They have some kind of magical skill to actually get things done, solving problems that us mortals can't do. And, and the good thing is people, just like a magician in a, in, a, in a show, people go like, wow, oh. So they have this talent of, of having people kind of go like, wow, that was impressive. Uh, the absolute weakness, and I'm sure you all understand this, that the magician forgets that it's a big difference between doing magic tricks just to make people go, ah, and actually getting stuff done. So it kind of, I would say the weakness of a magician approach is that you can do in, a, in a one meeting, you can do these quick tips and tricks and magician things, but did it actually solve the problem? Or you just, just make few people feel like the problem was solved. And then you go away and you never tell your tricks. Still few to go. This is the pill believer. This is, this is the, I would say, if you may, well, it says on the shield, this is maybe comes from the agile development culture. People who really believe very close to the bureaucrat that they do believe the process. But if the bureaucrat is more of an objective, rational person, I think this Jean d'Arc, if you will, is more of a believer. They don't have the science, they don't have the facts, they don't have the rules and regulations, but they believe in it. You know, the agile manifesto, it can't be wrong. It's almost like a God-given thing. And these people are fantastic, or this style is fantastic. People are inspired by other people who are committing to principles. Come what may, we're having a retrospective next Friday because that is almost sacred. I'm like, wow, yeah, I want that person in my team. And of course it goes into the social function, the ability to convert others, especially if you're bringing new ways of working, you're bringing new tools to a situation People are a bit hesitant to change. There is a reluctance to change. So maybe you need the believer who goes like, yeah, we just need to do this. Let's do this over again. Let's make this into a routine. It will take us weeks and months before we can see the benefits of it. And then people follow the believer. Second to last, the boss whisperer. This is kind of a, if you want, this is kind of a, top management consultant role. Uh, but this is a different way of facilitating. This is kind of the secretary, but you're very close to the secretary and the servant, but you actually have very strong opinions of your own. 
but your talent is that you really understand the worldview of an executive and you don't go there and tell them like a revolutionary would tell them that this is what you need to do the revolution is coming you got to react no because your talent is in influencing in very subtle ways that the people the executives start seeing the changes themselves so a boss whisperer can be very very revolutionary very progressive can be a very believer as well if you will but they don't bring that forth because they know that if they're too strong with their opinions, then maybe the others kind of clam up. They don't listen to them. So they're kind of taking the hard way of convincing and teaching and showing people new ways of leadership or working or running business and so forth. And their biggest fear, of course, is that they look like the conservative old school thinkers because they dress like them, they talk like them, they hang out like with them. But that, you know, in their heart of hearts, they're trying to change things. They are a change agent. And this is, of course, a very powerful role if you take it. Uh, and in many situations, this might be the role that you kind of, this is, of course, building kind of trust and rapport in the people you want to change. So you dress up like them, you talk like them, you have all the experience about them. And then last, uh, but not least, is the regular gal or regular guy. This is a facilitation style. This is just like in those pressure, you know, you don't stand out. You're, you're the kind of the, you're the person who's not threatening everybody. Or like it says in the talents, you're so easy, you're so approachable that people kind of you actually influence people even without them noticing it. Kind of like the boss whisperer, but very different approach. And typically if you are, let's say if you're very junior, that you don't have a lot of experience, this might be the style that you take. Because you can start using phrases such like, you know, I just graduated from university. I don't really understand why are we doing it like this? Or, or saying that, you know, uh, teach me because I don't get it. Uh, I read from this book that we're not supposed to swear at each other. Is, is, is that kind of, am I getting this wrong? Or, you know? So you can play the kind of the regular gal guy card. And the point is that you're one of the team. You're not standing out, but you're kind of part of it. Uh, but if, of course, the kind of the great weakness here is that, that you need to, uh, you have the courage to speak up. That when if the situation is such that you really have to raise your hand and say that well, you know, hey i don't agree with you does the ordinary guy or gal do they do that is that the style maybe you change the style good so there's plenty of them some people have told me that yeah at least 13 is a lot can you kind of cut them down well i guess i could there's some overlap in them the secretary is close to the servant who's close to the boss whisperer. But the boss whisperer is actually close to the uh, revolutionary as well. Uh, the bureaucrat is very close to the believer and so forth. But nevertheless, we went through them all. And now I'm asking you, yeah, I see it. They already have very uh, interesting points here. Uh, I mean, a few comments about Hanna putting you <laughs> on. Uh, does the style you take or play depend on your audience? Hmm. That's pretty much what I'm asking you to do next in the breakout rooms. Yari, are you doing the breakout or should I do it from here? I can do it from here. So what we're going to do is put you again into groups. And if you don't want to, you can just say that you don't want to join the group. That's as easy as that. Don't be afraid. So uh, that's the, you can see, 10 minutes to discuss what it says over there. I think uh, it's six and seven per group, is that enough? Or should we have a little bit more? Is that good? 25. So five, five to six participants six, minus the people who don't want to yeah. join. Yeah, we'll go there. So have a look, discuss what brought up. What, 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 what did you think about these archetypes? Did you find yourself in them? Are you a mixture of some? Or like this great question here, uh, 
about that, you know, the situation depends, the context, and how does the context push you or encourage you to take certain styles? Uh, I can tell Matti later about how these emerge, but... Should, should they write something in chat or just... Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks, Yari. Mm -hmm. So do drop a few lines, three bullets, two to three bullets, and uh, about what did you discuss. Now I'm going to create the room soon and make all the uh, options here. Just count timers. And then we're going to mix you, so we're going to check that nobody is all alone. Move all automatically. Here we are back. Everybody seems to be back. Uh, hey, please, write some pointers into the chat. Thank you, Group 9. You win a prize. Uh, I actually just wrote Group 9, but you win the prize anyway. <laughs> Thanks, everybody else as well. You seem to have them on a copy paste quick. Easter egg beats. Hmm. Good. I'll put this one over there. And then let's see if you have anything interesting. I'm sure you have interesting. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> is that a is slacker? Is that a facilitation style? Hey, I am Risto. I'm your facilitator for this workshop. And I'm not gonna do anything. <laughs> That's a good one. Mm. We have probably one or two primary styles which are dominant. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent point. Kind of like your personality that, you know, or maybe you're comfortable with this. Yara, you had a concept. What was it? Dominant. Dominant style. Dominant style. You mentioned this this week. Supporting when we think. styles. Mm -hmm. Different personas fit to different situations. Absolutely, absolutely. I think the basic for at least for us who are who uh, have children. You, the easy thing to start understanding different social roles is that just compare yourself uh, at home with your kids that what kind of a leader are you and then look at what kind of a leader you are at work and the contrast is most probably very uh, easy to spot let's put it that way but the fact is of course that we are in different social contexts we actually show different kind of how should I say facets of ourselves that is basic social theory so uh, I'm going to now introduce, we have still uh, about a little bit over 10 minutes to go, the exercise. And uh, the exercise is really trying to help to find your own style and to kind of help you build, at least, for, you know, there was the self-reflection and all of that before. So we're kind of asking you to start doing your own facilitator's passport. Uh, you could call your facilitator portfolio or CV. Yeah, maybe portfolio on CV, that's more like listing your projects, but this is more of a passport to show that, have you thought about this? Have you, you know, reflected about this and so forth? Again, this is not uh, anything scientific as such. Uh, this is more based on practical uh, experience, but definitely based on everything we have talked about in this whole course and kind of trying to bring it together that when we thought about what, what kind of a tool would kind of now help you to start looking about your own, own facilitation style? And here are four dimensions. I'm going to soon go over each of these. What, what's the point? And uh, these are, again, a conversation starter, more or less, or a framework for you to use. This is not the uh, be-all, end-all truth of facilitation. And you can disagree with this. And if you do, please do write that in your, in your exercise report. So the first one, the first dimension is tools and processes. So this was, was it last time or the time before when we really looked at tools and processes? Kind of blended. Uh, and the point is that, okay, what tools do you have? What tools do you use? And here I put this uh, Sensei Wu, uh, Gu, uh, who is of course a, a sensei, a teacher <laughs> in the Ninjago stories to say something about what's the point. And the point is that if you want to adapt, apply and adjust different tools, you of course need to master them. You need to understand what tools and processes. And by processes here, I mean processes such as a, I don't know, design process or a typical how a project works process and so forth. 
So it could be, here's my kind of a quick list. And remember my background is, my background is specifically uh, from service design and then consultancy and all that. So this is, might be tinted a little bit from my background, but you can add yours. So the question to ask, how familiar are you with certain tools and processes? Do you know service design? Should you know lean startup, agile development tools, processes? Is growth hacking something? So kind of listing that, again, things that you think that you should know, things that you already know. And of course, not maybe, maybe listing things that you should not know, but starting about thinking about this. Uh, what do you want to have in your password? Strategy work, academic research, that is a process which has certain tools in it and so forth. So that's kind of the first dimension. As a facilitator, what are the tools and the processes that you're familiar with? And also, which ones do you think that you would like to go and learn as a facilitator? Then the, the other one. So all of these four dimensions are more or less kind of, they're not dependent on each other. They're almost kind of independent dimensions, if you will. Of course, a little bit overlap, uh, no doubt about it. But the big picture is really what also, I think you were, Yara, you had also the kind of the big picture in the, in the industrial context and all that. And, but also the big picture in a sense that what we did in one of those exercises that you actually, the last week's exercise, the before and the after. And that's what the uh, speech bubble there is saying. That if you think about last week's exercise as a workshop, I would provoke you saying that, you know, 75% of the success of your workshop happens before the workshop starts. The preparation, uh, picking the right people, explaining them the expectations, all that stuff that needs to be done before the workshop starts. That pretty much, you know, if you do that well, 75% of success done. And then kind of provocatively saying that what happens after your workshop is the rest of it. So kind of, you know, the workshop doesn't matter that much if you do the preparation work and the desired impact is happening. But that's really the big picture. So how good are you as a facilitator in understanding strategies? How good are you at organizational structures, business processes, or maybe public sector processes? How do, the, how do these big industries, markets, organizations, sectors, how do they work? Where do they fit in? Where does your work fit in? Where does the project fit in? company cultures, decision-making, governance models, politics. And you can see it's really echoing back the kind of stuff that Yari had in his map of what are the meta skills required. Third, the people. If you're a facilitator, the kind of the material you're working with other people or you're making the people succeed. You're trying to get those people to achieve something. And that's what Sensei Wu is here reminding us. You know, you're not the superstar. It's not about you. It's making others succeed. And then we just talk about different styles. Uh, we're going to get back to that in the fourth dimension. But when we talk about people, how good are you with people skills in all simplicity? How good are you figuring out people's attitudes, motivations, their commitments? And whether it's a project, whether it's a huge organization transformation, whether it's a single meeting, you know, if you understand these things, then, you know, magic starts happening. And, uh, and you can already see that these require certain skills. For example, the second one, unearthing people's personal goals and aspirations. How do you facilitate and help people to tell them? So what do you want to be? You know, where do you want to go? What are your goals? What is your agenda in this project? Listening to people, understanding other people's expectations towards you as a facilitator, uh, charting people's true status in an organization, for example, and so forth. Listening to other people and hearing other people. Remember the difference between that. You can listen to other people and say, well, that person said A, B, and C, but did you actually hear what they were kind of trying to tell you? That's a skill. Then the fourth one is really what this today, or, or pretty much the, or those uh, characters, archetypes were about, finding your own style. So just like what Yari said earlier, a 
about the self-awareness. You need to know yourself to build confidence, to build trust, to build rapport. Because if you are the facilitator, people need to trust you. They're trusting you with a specific role. And those archetypes just was an example that there are very many different roles. But people are trusting you to take a certain role with certain responsibilities, for example. So how self-aware are you? How good are you? For example, these are from the midwife blog post I gave you last week. How good are you teaching others? Is that something in your style? How good are you remaining calm under pressure? When uh, somebody tells you, for example, that you have just prepared for a workshop and somebody tells you, this is not at all what we were expecting. Do you remain calm or do you panic? Uh, are you a people's person? What's your confidence? Do you have, you know, are you confident in that situation or are you not? And if you're not, what are you going to do about it? Because then you can start thinking about the different styles or the archetypes that, you know what, I think there was one great example. Somebody was last week's exercise was saying that it's really interesting if you don't know anything, if you're not an expert at all of the other person's domain. <laughs> so that's, again, when we put you together randomly, you know, you could get a pair that works on a topic and substance that you just don't understand anything. So how can you be confident? Where do you get your confidence? Or do you just go openly and say, you know, I don't understand anything. But nevertheless, I can facilitate you. How do you take care of your own well-being? That's something uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about next week. Being a facilitator, change agent, leader, change manager is, is a very task, uh, taxing. It's, it just requires a lot of a good mental well-being. And just basic stuff about yourself. What are your strengths, weaknesses? What are the battle scars? Which are like, hey, yeah, this, I got this from that and that project. And you know, all of these kind of things that build trust, build rapport, build your own confidence for you. Maybe you don't have to tell the battle scars to everybody, but you go against the mirror and go like, yeah, yeah, I've been through worse stuff. So there we go. So that's, yeah, Yari, you want to add something? Uh, what about the pair work? Here we go. All right, it was there. <laughs> uh, so here's what we're asking you to do in more detail. Uh, we're going to have the slides uh, again ready for you, most probably tomorrow morning when you wake up, everything's there in the meeting. So we're going to do this double thing again. Uh, but you're going to do it first. Start the exercise alone. So give yourself alone some time and go over the passport. Reflect on your own skills. Look at the four dimensions given. What are you good at? You know, what do you want, where you should learn? What do you want to learn and what you should learn are actually two different questions. And if you think something's missing in the model, please do add that. And then you get together with your pair and then you go over with each other's passports. And, and you kind of, if you think about your passport, now this is the model where you kind of write it up or draw or however you want to document it with the help of the other person. And the help of the other person is the other role you're going to take. Your job again is to facilitate. Uh, so you're going to be facilitating a facilitator writing a facilitation passport. Mm -hmm. You can't get any more meta than that. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, I, we put some sparring questions here. So if you're helping the other person do this passport, it's like, you know, explain me, what's your job and, and why do you think facilitation is important for you? And, you know, kind of these people skills again. How do you help the other person kind of unearth and find out what they are good at or what are their strengths at or what are their goals and aspirations and so forth. Okay, looks like people are all leaving. Uh, and here's again, reflect together the exercise, all in all simplicity. By this time, you should be. Uh, and we're not gonna, don't leave before the poll, please, please, please. And of course, if you need to mark your uh, participation, you can do that just like a lot of people are doing as we speak. Everything is now on Medium. Go and check it out. All lecture videos are there now. So all the previous lectures are there on YouTube video. Uh, so if you want to go back or you want to share them or you want to give them as a... Is there some festivity coming? Mm -hmm. Midsummer present, you know, yes. to your loved ones. I care about you. I gave you this validation lecture videos. 
<laughs> okay, next week is final lecture and, and, and uh, we're gonna wrap things up, look forward. And if you want, you know, you can put in the chat now if you want something about last lecture, if you want to point out something. Yeah, please. And now we're launching the poll. Uh, yeah, we're launching the poll. No, please, please answer it. It's pretty much just asking about uh, how did we do today. Also, we put the second question, which one is your favorite archetype for yourself? But it turns out that Zoom allows only 10 options. So we don't have the last three. Talk about context pushing you into situations that you don't necessarily want. How are we time-wise? I think it is six o'clock. Yeah, oh, it's still one minute to go. Yeah. Please oh. answer the poll. Answer the poll. Uh, drop a line in the chat if you, you know, want us to dress up funny for the final lecture or, or whatever you uh, wishes you have. But thank you again for all of you this week. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can see that we actually enjoy this with Yari. Hmm. And, and I hope, we very, very much hope that you enjoy and learn as well. I'm going to go on mute now, but I'm going to have my headphones on. So if you have a question. Yes. Thank you, Yari and Risto for the great lecture again. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And have a nice Hela Torstai. Paul is still open. Yeah, please. Great Hela Torstai for everybody. Yeah. Enjoy your weekend. OK, maybe we can now end. Right. Yeah, we'll end it. Let's see the result. We need to take a picture of the results. Again, 66% liked a lot, 32 it was okay. I think we are